Oh, I was going to say, how good has been this conference? Seriously, can we, I know we've done it before, but can we give one more round of applause to Dorinda and everyone involved in this? <clears throat> Second thing before I forget, if my legs are shaking, it's a mix of nerves and I ran seven kilometers with Dorinda this morning. <laughs> so if you know anything about me, uh, you know that I'm slightly obsessed with utility-first CSS. And I have been talking and obsessing about it for quite a while. Um, I've talked in 2018 in front of a Laravel crowd. Uh, and actually, I've been talking about utility-first CSS since before uh, Tailwind CSS actually is a thing. Uh, but today, I want to do something different. I want to take a spectrum from design to dev. And I want to tell you why I think that Tailwind CSS is the ultimate collaboration tool uh, between designer and developers for cross-functional teams. So uh, do we have any designers in the house that consider themselves designer first? Yeah, couple. Do we have developers that work daily with designers? <clears throat> OK, so half the audience. That's good. So when we talk about designers and developers, we need to talk about design handover. And this is the concept of designers coming with an idea, a concept, and then designing it and handing it over to the developers to go and implement. And that leaves that little section here sort of straight line and a bit fragile. And in projects, quite often, this is where little hiccups can happen. So even with teams of trained professionals, designers, and developers, <laughs> Uh, even with professionals, some things can happen. And the reason is some things in designs are difficult to hand over. So let's take this card, for example. We can see uh, the font size, the spacing, typography. Maybe on the slide you can see the border radius, the border color. But how do you hand over something like this interaction at the bottom? See, rich interactions are pretty hard to hand over. So of course, designers can use tools to mock up some animations. Uh, but also on the developer side, if you're a developer and you receive a video and say, hey, can you build this? I don't know about you, but as a dev, I would be a little bit intimidated at least. So I have a revelation. These cards you're looking at, they were built by a designer. <laughs> and <laughs> when I mean designer, I mean someone who spent their day, their week, in design tools like Figma, like Sketch, uh, drawing pictures of elements to then hand over to a developer to build. The work you're looking at now is the creation of a good friend and colleague of mine, Chris Dale. He's the senior designer at ThinkMail, where I work as well. <coughs> Excuse me. And in this instance, you're looking at a website for the Seed.js meetup, Sydney JavaScript meetup, it's in the name, that ThinkMail helps co-organize. And so Chris, as a designer, designs it in Figma and then hands it over to a developer in that instance, myself, uh, and I go and build it. But because we're a cross-functional team, I don't wait for the Figma design to be finished. I lurk around and watch the little cursor moving, and <laughs> I go uh, and implement what's already in place, knowing full well that I can just tinker alongside the design. And so we have this nice parallel workflow going. And then to add some more parallels to the story, uh, there is an other meetup in town, React Sydney, that we suddenly think, hmm, we should maybe also build a website for React Sydney because we also organize it, and there's probably a lot of similarities between the elements. And so now, as a developer myself, I'm like, oh, OK, should I build components that are themable, and should we publish them on NPM uh, because it's using React here, and just share them or have a monorepo architecture so we can consume these packages? And before I go too far with the craziness, I'm like, hang on. We don't know if we're going to ship both these sites. So let's just for now duplicate the repo and then tweak the styles. After all, Tailwind makes it super simple to, to risk in some UI. So while we're having this conversation of who does what and when, enters a Boris. 
Boris is the co-founder of ThinkMill and the head of product design. And inspired by his beautiful commute to work in the morning, it literally is his commute to work, uh, he hits me with the following. Simon, I've been thinking about Tailwind a lot. I think I'm ready. I think we should train the whole design team. Uh, and I want everyone to be comfortable designing, thinking, prototyping in the browser with Tailwind. Whew. My man. <laughs> <laughs> This is music to my ear, right? And he, he continues, uh, he says, uh, Oop, the plan is to not stop using Figma. Figma is a great tool, but we should move to the code a little bit sooner than we do. So I'm completely on board, but what we need to do to train this uh, team is to have the right opportunity. We cannot just throw the designers in the wildfire of agency world with deadlines and stakeholders. <laughs> We need a safe, low-risk, high-reward space to foster a learning environment. And so, turn out this React Sydney Meetup thing, perfect. There is no real stakeholders. There's not even a deadline. No one knows we're going to build a site. We just had the idea, so it's, it's our little thing. So we decide that Chris and I are going to pair on some Tailwind CSS onboarding. And so we conceptually take the existing site that's still being built, and I go and show him what the process would look like if we wanted to reskin, say, the event card. And I'm explaining to him the beauty about Tailwind is it's super simple and you focus on one element at a time. So if you want to change the, the, the background of this card, we want to remove rounded corners and have a hard, solid border instead. Just remove the rounded corners, add a border instead. Then you move to the next element. We want to have a different badge. We remove the border this time, and we add a background color. And I show him, you don't have to worry, because one by one, you focus on one element. You don't change anything anywhere on the application. So you basically, like you're in Figma, selecting some options, restyle this. And mind you, I'm showing this here, but when I say you just change the font size, it's not just a random value. Like this developer experience proposes Autocomplete suggestions of scales of predefined values. And if you know designers, this is how they think. They love using design tokens and creating scales of harmonious values and then consume them. And I'm telling Chris, yeah, dude, this is, this is the essence of Tailwind. So if you have custom colors, you just add them to your theme, and then you can reach for this highlight and accent colors anywhere that you need for borders, background, gradients, carrot, cursor, all these things. And I can see Chris's eye light up. <laughs> and he, li he did literally send that to me on Slack. And I can sense that he's really getting the hang of it. And with a bit of CSS help, he's on his way. So I kind of give him some homework, some CSS layouts uh, concepts, some YouTube videos to watch of me, yes. <laughs> and uh, then I go back to doing something else. I'm working on an unrelated project. and. Uh, a few moments later, <laughs> Chris, uh, that was going to give me pictures of buttons for me to implement, instead gives me a URL, react.sydney, a live production website for the React Sydney Meetup. It's live. Uh, and see the button interaction here. He was able to do it himself instead of asking me, hey, can you tweak the easing? And so this is a legit website. It, it got code reviewed by an engineer at ThinkMill, not me. But that person was like, it's just styles change, very straightforward, approve, ship it. And so Chris went from uh, handing over pictures of elements to shipping to production, uh, which is a big deal. And I think it really unleashed Chris into the world of front-end development. From that point forward, uh, Chris's involvement also with real client projects with real deadlines has drastically changed. Speaking of unleashing, prepared for an unleashing of cuteness. <laughs> yes, I added this slide yesterday after seeing all the dogs uh, in the talk. These are my two dogs. And thanks to Keith, you also have yet to see my cat. <laughs> I literally added the slide while I was getting mic'd up. Um, so let me show you another example. And I have to stay on the cross, I remember. This uh, is another product that I uh, think we'll build, Keystatic. And that's the marketing homepage. I actually built this homepage about a year and a half ago. And I was working on something unrelated when Chris appears again and he says, hey, we're about to ship a refresh of the brand. Go take a look. Let us know what you think. 
And so I go to this site that I know to look like this, and hit refresh, and broop, it looks now like this. And I'm like, ooh, this is nice. So I scroll down to work out what else is nice on this page. And this is when I land on this grid of cards that we've seen at the start of the talk. Instantly, my brain goes to this place. I'm like, all right, this is a canvas element, and there's three JS or LUTI files or Rive animation, some sort of complex JavaScript animation library. But upon uh, inspection with the DevTools, nope, it's all 100% Tailwind utilities, default Tailwind utilities. Uh, <laughs> And I'm quite surprised because to me that did not scream Tailwind at first sight, and I've seen a lot of Tailwind sites. And so my next uh, brain move goes to, okay, Chris has uh, reskinned the basic, the background, the fancy SVG that we've seen, and then a senior UI engineer went and did the crazy card because they're, they're freaking awesome. And so I go in Slack, I'm like, guys, who did this? This is so cool. Turns out it was Chris. Wait, what? <laughs> And literally, I was gobsmacked. Look, I haven't precise, but that was three weeks, maybe one month max, after I had onboarded the guy to the basics of Tailwind CSS. So my next thing that I ask Chris is, how? <laughs> what? <laughs> and Chris, super enthusiastic, as he always is, uh, tells me, dude, Tailwind is so easy. It's just like composition and timing. You just compose little things, and it's so cool. So let's try to break down what Chris means here. You are now familiar with this card, and we're going to have some simplified code. Uh, it's JSX, but you have a header section at the top, and then at the bottom we have this decorative UI thing. So on the wrapping element, the utmost element, we have this class of group, which in Tailwind CSS lets you do things like group hover. So when you hover on the group, in this case the group is the whole card, uh, we are going to scale the background SVG by 125%. So when the cursor enters the card, no matter if it's on the SVG or on the card, the whole group is hovered, so uh, the element zooms in. And then there's overflow hidden, so it kind of stays within the container. Pretty cool. So what about the other layers of the onion? So again, simplified code. We have here a circle. So it's just an, a span with a border and rounded full to make it circle with a border color. It's also meant to be hidden and transparent, but I'm showing it here so it makes sense. And so we then have the animate ping utility class. This is a default Tailwind uh, animation utility used, you can see in the docs, for um, stuff like a notification badge. And I thought that was really creative from Chris, and that's where the designer's thinking comes into play, to use that on a bordered circle instead of like a full shape to create that effect. So it's hidden, which is display none by default. And again, on group hover, we change it to display flex. It appears, and it pings, and the result looks like this. Nice little pulse, pulsing ring. And I've used the uh, animate ping many times. I did not recognize it, but now it makes complete sense. And so the last layer to look at is these two icons with a separator. We have a width of 12 on that little line in between. And then it gets, once again, on group hover, animated to zero with a bit of transition. And flex, doing flex things, the two icons will smoosh together as the line width changes. <clears throat> now, animating width is not always a good idea for performance reasons, and layout shift and all that. But here, it's inside a card element. Nothing else is moving around. So for me, it's, it's completely fine in this case. And so now's the cool thing. When you put it all together, what used to feel like dark magic, now I'm pretty sure your brain can see the three layers working together. And a lot more of you would feel comfortable that you might give it a shot and try to build something like this. Remember what Chris said? It's all about composition and timing. Yeah, but still, dude, come on. <laughs> and I still work with Chris to this day, and at least once a week, I pull that face of what happened. Chris and I, uh, these days, uh, among many other people at ThinkMill, work with a client called Infinex, which operates in the Web3 crypto decentralized finance space. And as you can see, the user interface is super elaborate. There's a lot of interactions and animations. 
So we do use Figma. There's a really talented team. Uh, here's another interaction example. We do use Figma extensively. The designers work in Figma. Chris involved, included, he still works in Figma. But whenever there is the need for some interactive UI, Chris, instead of hoping that the developers sort of get the, the sense of the animation and then tweak it through like sounds and stuff, uh, no, we just provide a full-blown Tailwind play with the interaction that he's got in mind. And then the design team, even the non-coding designers, can look at this and say, yeah, maybe change the, the, the ease-in should be a bit quicker and stuff like this. And I don't know about you, but for designers, I think that's a much more gratifying way to work and collaborate on a project rather than try to talk about the animation feel. Other example, this is the home page that I built uh, with this client, and we have this fancy grid, grid of cards. And again, that's a static image, but it's supposed to be an illustration. Why try to describe the illustration when you can just build it, says Chris. <laughs> and you might notice, again, the ping animation right there. Pretty cool use. So like I said, Chris really got unleashed into front-end development. And this is not a meetup website with no stakeholders. Matter of fact, the scale Infinex operates at is something I've never been part of. Uh, a month ago, they released a NFT sale. We talked about NFTs yesterday. In two weeks, they sold 67 million US dollars worth of NFTs. And it just, it, I couldn't comprehend the amount of traffic. So Chris is having an impact in this real world, real uh, deadlines, and real um, budget uh, environment. And I got to say, it's not just Chris. I have witnessed in my career multiple times already the moment where I onboard a true designer that just designs in Sketch or Figma, and I take them along the way on something like Tailwind or other utility-first approach, and proceed to witness them becoming proper design engineers in no time, because something clicks, and designers tend to love Tailwind. So let's try to enter their world a little bit, and we're going to put a designer hat for a second and build a simple button in Figma. So I have a text box. You can see I'm using auto layout. Uh, choose a background color for the button. Makes sense. Choose a text color. And then I'm going to go add some padding horizontal and vertical. That's where uh, auto layout is nice. <clears throat> and add some rounded corners, maybe change the font weight. And we have a beautiful button design in Figma. So now as an exercise, we're going to try rebuild the same button. But more importantly, think conceptually of the same design mental model. But we're going to do it in Tailwind Play. So I have a button. And I'm going to select a background color. I'm going to select a text color, padding horizontal, padding vertical. And you get the idea. Instead of choosing options from the right sidebar with the mouse, I'm like a power user. And with the keyboard, I can quickly reach for the design tokens and apply them to my HTML element. As a result, it's even faster because you can, it's known fact that if you use your mouse less, you get more productive. And <laughs> very developer way to think. But, um, but don't take my developer word. I, I think this is a design workflow. But remember Boris? He once said, Tailwind is the closest thing to design iteration and prototyping directly in the browser. Oh boy, I was so happy when he said that. Within one minute, I had screenshotted this, knowing full well I would use this in a talk one day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This would not be a real Tailwind CSS talk without at least one spicy hot take. Why not just teach CSS to these designers? I completely agree. I absolutely agree. You don't want to trap them in something they can only use, and then they don't actually understand how this works. Which is why when I teach how to build this button, I make sure that I explain what happens with Tailwind and the CSS that it generates as a result. Still, I will get some pushback every now and then. Like, no, no, but I mean normal CSS. Why don't we teach normal CSS? To what I may respond, come on, man. <laughs> But fine, if you want, we are going to make a button, abstract a class, go in a CSS file, and apply our key value pairs here to do proper CSS. And yeah, it's actually pretty quick. So what's the problem? I think the problem when you teach designers is this is a departure from the designing and prototyping mindset that they're common with. 
this is, has some subtle levels of architecture decisions, naming things, putting in a different file, where should it live, all of this. And that takes you away from the rapid prototyping that these designers tend to love at first sight. But also, if I look at this, I feel comfortable I can teach the exact same concept with Tailwind. So this padding top and bottom, I'm like, OK, so in Tailwind, we have the padding on the Y axis. And this is going to generate padding top, padding bottom. That's how CSS does padding. And then same deal, left and right, it's the PX class. And then the background color, same deal. And oh, look, I'm even teaching about CSS variable composition in the mix. Uh, so you get the idea. I am still teaching CSS, but I feel like I'm teaching CSS for designers or CSS for the design mindset and brain. Another thing Chris told me really early on about Tailwind that he loved is the quick syntax. He was like, this is what lets me iterate really quickly in the browser and I'm super productive. And you've seen Keith doing his like, class composition and design in the browser pretty much. The quick syntax, huh? you know what I'm talking about. The ugly HTML, <laughs> the one thing that the internet loves to hate about Tailwind. Turns out, go figure, this, I believe, is the magic ingredient of Tailwind CSS. Why? Because I think it's the fastest feedback loop from an idea to CSS in the browser. So you're visualizing an idea in your head, and then you see it in the browser through CSS. I don't think any tool gets you there faster. So prototyping a button is a bit boring, so let's crank it up a notch, and we're going to go about prototyping an entire calendar application UI. What you're about to see is a time-lapse video over 30 seconds. This is not a rehearsed, polished screencast on how to build this with Tailwind CSS. It's me receiving a Figma file from a designer and thinking, huh, I'll just hit record on my screen uh, and then just jam on it and try to prototype without really trying to nail it, but just as the proof of concept, get the various elements. The code is way too small to see. I don't want you to look at the code. I want you to look at the left and how I'm clearly designing and iterating and sometimes going down little rabbit holes uh, with trigonometry. <laughs> but you can see that I'm testing out some font sizes, spacing, width, and all that. And I'm really designing in the browser. I'm a developer, but I'm actually designing and I'm in the design mindset. And if you're a designer, you probably, probably recognize this sort of jam session in Figma where you try different values. And at the end of the session, which was about one hour, two hours probably, I've never left uh, my HTML file, or it's a JavaScript JSX file, but I never named the class. I just composed utilities together. And so I got to be a developer and a designer at the same time, which is, I think, a remarkable thing with Tailwind. Uh, shout out to my good friend Corey, who lives on the West Coast in Perth. Good friend of Mandy. I know Mandy is on the flight right now. Uh, he's a true designer. He was a true designer. Uh, years ago already, he said, I'm pretty shocked by Tailwind because it's easier to design than a design tool. And then when you finish designing, oh, you've got a website. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and that's another key thing with Tailwind that's amazing is the Prototyping code is actually also, can also be the production code. Sometimes you're going to want to abstract components, but the, the, work show, the workflow of sprinkling classes on an element really rapidly and designing in HTML elements is the intended way to go and ship to production. So you're not throwing away code, you're just writing this, and then this can go to prod. Uh, Corey these days works at a company called BuildKite. You may have noticed they launched a new website uh, about a month ago that looks fantastic. Uh, he, his role there is now a senior design engineer. And every single designer at BuildKite is a design engineer. They literally started hiring only people who work in code because they want everyone to move the source of truth to the code and contribute to this. And speaking with Corey, it was really clear that Tailwind really played a role to bridge that gap between design and dev by making it more accessible to non-developers. So that's what I really like about Tailwind. It invites designers to try to write code. But as you've seen with my prototyping before, it also invites developers to try to design and prototype. There's really this cross-functional pollination happening both ways. Now, why Tailwind? There are a lot of tools on the spectrum from design to dev. 
On the dev, on the design-centric uh, side, excuse me, we have tools like Sketch and Figma. These tools are clearly, we are design tools. They don't hide it. They let you create realistic experiences that feel real. Uh, and then, once you design this, you invite developers into that world and provide the tools to help them build the actual real thing. So I love Figma. I use it quite a lot. But I think Figma tries to make the design app the source of truth. And I strongly believe, like we've seen with Boris as well, that we should move to code as the source of truth much sooner. On the other end of the spectrum, we have um, the dev tools, dev-centric. And if we look at the marketing copy, the, the concerns are clearly different. TypeScript, type safety, scalability. And if we look at the code examples, as a developer, I love this. But a designer who wants to dip their toes into front-end development will most definitely shy away from this. So I just want to make sure that it's clear that all of these tools right there are really good tools, and they all serve great purposes. <clears throat> I've literally used all of them and like all of them. But I think Tailwind hits an absolute sweet spot right in the mid. OK, it's not in the middle. It's a little bit of a dev tool. <laughs> but conceptually, it sits close enough to design that designers will take a look at it. And once they do, the first thing they're greeted with on the home page marketing hero is that prototyping, consuming design tokens directly in your HTML to assemble a UI like you're designing. And they're already warmed up at this point. And then if they happen to end up seeing the color scales and the spacing scales and the amount of attention put together in the uh, documentation for design uh, concerns, they're hooked. That's a wrap. <laughs> and speaking of wrap, um, <clears throat> to wrap things up, I just want to reiterate that I think Tailwind is the ultimate cross-functional design dev tool out there on the market. And the reason it takes this handover segment that used to be the problem space where some hiccups happen and there's confusion, and it turns this uh, like shortfall and makes it the place where designers and developers collaborate together and have a good time together. And turns out, when your designers and your developers play on the same field, you can achieve much more impactful and robust applications. <laughs> I'm going to make you watch it another time because it took me way too long to animate. <laughs> and with that, I want to say thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for coming back uh, and talking to us about Tailwind again. One of the questions we had from the audience was, what tools or environment do you suggest that designers who may not have written any code before use to prototype with Tailwind? Definitely, starting point is Tailwind Play. So it's play.tailwindcss.com. Uh, once again, this tool was designed to hit designers in the sweet spot where when you change a value, you don't even have to save. It instantly updates the UI. And so you can go in one of the scales, like the color or spacing, and hit the bottom arrow, and you can see the UI kind of like show you the, the feedback. Even I, as a developer, I use Tailwind Play because it's way faster feedback loop. So it accelerates that feedback loop that's already fast to something even faster. Nice. Um, how do you introduce designers to component-based Tailwind to make sure that you've got consistency across a product? Yeah, so that's uh, I've skipped that bit in the talk, but. In the onboarding with Chris, there was a lot of also onboarding to... So at ThinkMill, we work a lot with React, Next.js, and lots of tools like this. So uh, there was a lot of uh, mentoring on how to abstract, when to abstract. But the, the essence remained the same. I told Chris, Tailwind, the way you use Tailwind in Laravel, in Blade Files, in .NET, in any language, doesn't change. Even at big scale, it's always changing styles on one element, and it doesn't affect the rest. So when you abstract a component, you just move that thing, and then you can laser focus on that piece of UI. Even if it's reused everywhere, it's just one place where you change it. So I just try to explain abstraction principle and programming, and this is where this becomes more like, a, mm -hmm. uh, like the sort of thing Joe is doing, like teaching HTML, CSS, JavaScript. But um, Tailwind, in essence, is the thing that clicks instantly with designers. Nice. Have you had any pushback from designers 
in trying this approach? Is it like a, you know, that feeling in the back of your throat? The great thing, and I think this is why I specialize into this side of the, <laughs> the spectrum now, <laughs> is designers instantly love Tailwind. I had never had pushed back because it aligns so well with the... You, you tell them, look, uh, the team at Tailwind has sweated hours to have really nice defaults for shadows and spacing and all that, and then you can customize it, and there's, there's never anyone in design world that says, oh, terrible idea. Uh, so. If you, have, I had conversations yesterday, and a lot of you told me that you had trouble convincing your team that you like Tailwind, and you, it's, it, you have like this uh, visceral fight <laughs> with your team or CTO or whatever. Uh, when onboarding designers, it's much more streamlined and easy. Nice. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you.